I lift our voice to the Almighty God and bless His holy name. Give Him glory, give Him honor, give Him adoration. Bless the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Bless the ancient of days. Give Him glory, give Him honor. Give Him adoration. Bless Him. Bless Him. Bless him. Worship him. He's worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be adored. Give him glory. Give him honor. Give him adoration. He's worthy to be praised. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Give him all the glory, all the honor, all the adoration. Bless his holy name. There's no one like him. He is the almighty God. Thank you, Daddy. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, glory be to your body. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. What a mighty God we serve. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's a mighty
King of kings and Lord of lords, ancient of days, the unchangeable changer, the Holy One of Israel, the Almighty God, the one with whom nothing shall be impossible, the great and mighty consuming fire, Glory be to your holy name. Thank you for January. Thank you for February. Thank you for March. Thank you for April. Thank you now for May. Accept our worship in Jesus' name. Our great and wonderful consuming fire demonstrate your power tonight in the lives of every one of us whatever is not going to bring glory to your name burn it off tonight at the end of the day Lord God Almighty I pray that many of your children here today will become your partners. Thank you, Almighty God. Glory be to your holy name. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Well, let someone shout, Hallelujah. Uh, that's not bad. Um. I've just returned from a visit to Europe and uh, during our European convention, a woman shared a testimony that uh, she came to the program very sick. But as soon as I took the microphone and I said, let somebody shout hallelujah. <laughs> you see the the problem with many of us is we wait till the end of the sermon before we expect our miracle so You don't have to wait till the end of the service. You don't have to wait till maybe God will mention your case. Why must you endure pain till the end of the service?
let me ask you a question. When do you want your wall of Jericho to fall? Uh, tomorrow morning? Why don't you shout a great hallelujah to God? God is bringing this in now, but I have told you before that the reason I don't conduct services like some of my great brothers do is by starting, you know, binding the devil and so on and so forth. It's because number one, if I bind the devil yesterday and I have to bind him again today, that means he must be very slippery. So if I bind him at the beginning of the sermon, how do I know he will not get loose before I finish? And I've learned long ago that wherever they are praising your enemy, you don't want to be there. Do I hear somebody shout hallelujah? In the name of the one who called me, I decree that whatever is not of God in you will be burned by fire. And it will happen by the next time you shout, Hallelujah. Thank you, Daddy. Amen. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. And if you believe and you confess with your mouth, you shall have it. So I want you to confess with your mouth to two or three people and say, I've already received my own. Amen. God bless you. Now put your hands together for the Almighty God. Put your hands. And, and you may please be seated. 
except those who are born in the month of May. So if you are born in the month of May, you, you sign. My Father, my God, I want to thank you for your children born in the month of May. May is the fifth month of the year. Five is the number of grace and favor. So I commit all these your children into your hands. Please, Lord, show them special favor. Give them a new beginning of favor. Let them find favor with you. Let them find favor with men. In the morning, let them find favor. In the afternoon, let them find favor. In the evening, let them find favor. As they serve you, increase their favor. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Well, congratulations. God bless you. We may then be seated. Thank you. <laughs> Somebody said, Hallelujah is the only thing that can do it. <laughs> I believe the reason God has decided to give you your miracle in advance is because the issue we want to discuss tonight requires just solemn teaching. My son who came before me had done a great job. and has brought the fire down. He has done the job of an evangelist. We thank God for his life. We thank God for the choir. As usual, they've done extremely well tonight. And believe me honestly, I think we should really thank God for the engineers. I mean, a miracle had happened. They are doing excellently well now. Let's encourage them so that they will continue to do so. <laughs> the June Holy Ghost service, which will be on the 7th of June, has a team, and the team is the rod of fire. And the interesting thing is that uh, that's when we'll be hearing our youth making presentations again. And you know, these young ones have become so good that uh, I just keep rejoicing when it is their turn. But tonight we are talking about being in partnership with fire. Exodus chapter 3, reading from verse 7 to 12. And get your writing materials because we, will, we are going to do a thorough Bible study. Because by the time we are leaving here in the morning, I want you to be a partner with God. Exodus chapter 3 from verse 7 to 12. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. 
And I'm come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel come unto me, and I have also seen the oppressions wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I, that I should go unto Pharaoh? and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. And he says, Certainly I will be with thee. As somebody here tonight, you will never walk alone again. And this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. In every company, there are people who come to buy goods. We call them customers. They come, pay for what they want, collect, and go. They are called customers. And we have people like that in the church. They come expecting to get something from Jesus Christ and they are willing to pay. Because tell me how much I need to pay and then give me my miracle and I go. I know. Because that's how I came to the Redeemed Christian Church of God. I had problem that my mathematics could not solve. And somebody told me if I get to the dream Christian Church of God, God is answering prayers there. And I came, and I told them my problem, and I was expecting them to tell me how much I will pray so that I can get my miracle and go back to my home. Instead, they began to talk to me about giving my life to Jesus, forsaking my sin, etc., etc. I didn't like it at all. They didn't ask me to pay. They asked me to stay. I thank God that I came as a customer. But today, by the grace of God, I'm a partner. I pray for all of you who are customers. That before this night is out, you will become partners of the Most High. Then in every company, you have the people we call the staff. These are the people who keep the company going. They earn their living there. They are called the staff. And some of them, you look down on them because you think they are very low. Like cleaners and messengers. But do you know that without the cleaners, the company is not going to last long, as low as you think. For example, there are some people who have dedicated themselves to washing every chair 
in these auditoriums, the one here and the one in the old. That's why when you come, you don't have to clean your chair because it has been washed by volunteers. They are not paid for it. They just come, large number of them, wash the chairs. You may not recognize them, you may not consider them as important, but God is watching and is keeping a record of all their activities. So we have the staff, and of course the staff are in categories, like I said, uh, cleaners, messengers, and then you begin to go higher, cashier, accountant, manager, uh, senior manager, etc., etc. Those who are called the staff, their very life depends on the company. If the company should sack them, they will have a bit of a problem feeding their families. But then there is another group higher than staff, and that's the ones we call partners. Partners with the owner of the company. Now, when we begin to talk about partners, you, I'm sure you must know that there are two categories of partners. We have the senior partner, usually the owner of the company. And then we have maybe one or two junior partners. The senior partner is called the chairman. He's a big boss. He owns the company. But he shares with the junior partners certain things. And we will discuss these things tonight. Now, partnership is originally the idea of God himself. From the very, very beginning, he was interested in partnership. We all know that he's the Almighty. He can do anything he wanted to do. But when you read Genesis chapter 2, from verse 19 to 20, Genesis 2, 19 to 20. After he created everything, every animal, every bird, he took them to Adam. And say, hey, Adam, I've been doing a lot of work creating this, creating that. Now, be my partner. Name them for me. Whatever name you call them, that's the name they will bear. So the first partner with God was Adam. So in the text we read, we, we read today that we want to discuss in details, in Exodus chapter 3, if you read it from verse 8 to 10, he said to Moses, I have seen the sufferings of my people. I have decided this suffering must stop. Thank you very much. Because I was just going to say, I hope somebody will agree with me that the sufferings in our nations must stop. And then he turned around to Moses and said, well, let's do the work together. Go and bring my people out of bondage. 
Uh, Moses said, <laughs> I thought you said you have come to set them free. Who am I? That I have to go and face Pharaoh. And remember, God said, Don't worry, I will be with you. We are going to be partners. When you read Isaiah chapter 6 from verse 1 to 8, Isaiah 6 from verse 1 to 8, we may come back to that if God permits. You will discover that up to now, God is still saying, Who shall I send? Who will go for us? God is saying, I'm still looking for partners. As a matter of fact, something that he said in Ezekiel 22 from verse 29 to 31, Ezekiel 22 from verse 29 to 31, is almost frightening. He said when he looked down on a particular nation, and he saw all the evil that they, are, that they have done and they are doing. When he looked down on the nation and he saw corruption, and he saw banditry, and he saw all kinds of evil, he said, I look for a man. If, if only I can find just one man who will stand before me and say, God, I know you are angry, but please, please, consider me and don't release your anger. He said, I found none. was looking for just one man. I said, because there was no man. I couldn't find one. Well, then I released my anger. If God is looking for one man so that he can put an end to his anger against our nation, who will volunteer? Nobody said anything. <laughs> you are afraid. <laughs> he said, I look for one man. It reminds me of what used to happen in those days. Whenever I offend my mom, and whether you believe it or not, mothers don't want to cane their children. Because as they are cleaning the children, they are feeling the pain. And yet they know that if you don't handle your child very well, the child will get rotten. I've done something wrong. My mom, my mom wants to deal with me. And she will pretend to be looking for the kid. Creating a space where I can run out. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Any other mother like that here? <laughs> and by the time she finally finds the key, I've already found somebody, an elderly somebody, and I'm clinging to that fellow. And she will say, Oh, uh, Uriah, you're a lady. As God has rescued you. She didn't want to do it to start with. And she was looking for someone who would stand in the gap. Who will stand in the gap for the family today? For your family? Who will stand in the gap for our nation today? Let me hear you say amen. amen. Now that brings us to a big question. 
Why does the Almighty God need a partner? Why does the one who has the ability to do everything, why does he need a partner? Well, Psalm 115 verse 3, Psalm 115 verse 3 says, He's sovereign, so you can do as he likes. But it's a little, a little more than that. If God were to come down to Nigeria today or any other nation to deliver a warning, they won't be able to see him. <laughs> In Exodus 33, from verse 18 to 23, Exodus 33, 18 to 23, he told Moses, no man can see me and leave. So, if he wants to call somebody out of danger, come and be saved, he can come directly himself because you, you won't see who is talking to you. Secondly, the way he speaks makes it necessary for him to get a partner. First Kings chapter 19, from verse 11 to 12. First Kings 19, 11 to 12. says when he's speaking, he's speaking in a very still, small voice. Very few people can hear him. He barely speaks above whispers. I mean, I told you the first time I attended a fellowship after I became born again, at the University of Lagos and uh, somebody took me there to their fellowship and they were singing choruses and so on and all of a sudden as if by cue everybody became silent and then a brother began to prophesy thus hear the Lord and he began and I not the man who took me there I said when did God say that he said shh God is speaking. I said, I'm not hearing anything. Several times people have asked me, you'll be preaching, and all of a sudden you will stop and say, oh, daddy said. When did daddy say that? I pray for somebody here today that God will open your ears. Now, if he doesn't speak in that small, still voice, and then if he raises his voice, people will think it is thunder. John chapter 12, verse 28 to 29. John 12, from verse 28 to 29. He was speaking to Jesus Christ. And the people around said, Oh! Thunder. So, it's either he speaks silently, that many people won't even hear, or when he's speaking loud, you would think it is thunder. As a matter of fact, when you read Exodus chapter 20, from verse 18 to 19, Exodus chapter 20, from verse 18 to 19, the people said to Moses, go and hear from him and come and tell us. Uh, we, we don't want to hear from him. So God needs a partner when he wants to deal with people. And in the name that's above every other name, I pray he will find a new partner here tonight. Now, let's consider the senior partner. Because he's the most important person in the whole business. The senior partner. In our own case, the senior partner 
uh, is the owner and he has absolute control of everything that he wants done in the company whatever the junior partner does must be done in the name of the senior partner you cannot be a junior partner and dictate to the senior partner is a part senior partner who will tell the junior partner what to do you must do everything in the name of the senior partner for example in mark chapter 16 from verse 16 to 17 mark 16 from verse 16 to 17 he says oh, this i will follow them that believe in my name In my name, Mark 16, verse 17 there. He said, whatever you are going to do, do it in my name. You remember the story in 1 Samuel chapter 17, from verse 42 to 51. 1 Samuel 17, 42 to 51. David said to Goliath, I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts. In Acts chapter 19, read it from verse 11 to 17. Acts 19 from verse 11 to 17. When the Bible said God performed special miracles by the hand of Paul, the apostle. And some people say, oh, in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches, Demons come out. Demons say, Jesus we know. Paul, we know. We know the senior partner. We know the junior partner. Who are you? Maybe I should add this one. And say that tonight I decree in the name of Jesus that all your problems will be consumed by fire. <laughs> so, so the junior partner must be subject to the senior partner. That's very crucial. If we're ever going to become his partner, you must be subject to him. In Luke chapter 7, from verse 2 to 10, Luke 7, from verse 2 to 10, the centurion said to Jesus Christ, I also am under authority. My senior partner is in Rome. And in his name, I say to the soldiers under me, come, they come, go, they go. Because I use his name. He said, Jesus, I know you are under the authority of your father in heaven. That's why you can tell sickness, go, and it will go. Demons go, and demons will go. You want to be his partner, you must be ready to be subject to his authority. My son said during his own sermon that you must not argue with him. You don't argue with his senior partner. Whatever he says do, you do. Now, What are the things that you will get if you are subject to the senior partner? This is very important. As soon as you know, just like Jesus said, 
in Luke chapter 22, verse 42, Luke 22, verse 42, as soon as you know it's not my will, but thy be done. The moment you can get that one clear, from that moment onward, your Christian life will become enjoyable. After you have prayed, after you have quoted the Bible and you've done everything, you must see, remember, he is your senior partner. And you know when he says yes, it is yes. If he says no, it is no. The senior partner now performs certain things for the junior partner. And I'm being slow because I believe you are taking notes. Number one, he provides for the junior partner. The senior partner provides for the junior partner. Using whatever method that pleases him. First King chapter 17, from verse 2 to 17. First Kings 17, from verse 2 to 17. Oh, thank you, Father. Lord asked me to tell someone, you won't faint again. Yeah. The fellow concerned heard me clear, loud and clear. I think the fellow is somewhere far to my left there. The Almighty God said, you won't faint again. In First Kings chapter 17 from verse 2 to 17, when he decided to provide for Elijah, he said they would send birds, ravens, to bring bread and to bring meat. And everybody knows that bears love bread. And ravens in particular, they love meat. But when God sends them on an errand, they won't tamper with whatever he asks them to deliver. In the name that's above every other name, your miracle will not miss your address. the brook dried up he decided all right now there's no need sending birds here let me send you to a widow when, when, when God is speaking many a times we, we, we try to understand with our brain we forget that we are dealing with the one who is called the all-sufficient God. In one of our meetings, I think it was in Slovakia, about two weeks ago, the word of God came. Uh, thousands of people there. And God just said, there's someone here I know how to take care of the crisis in your family. How will I know? And the program took place on Sunday. How will I know that there was a couple there that were getting ready for divorce? By Monday morning, they said, no more divorce. 
what God did that night that led to reconciliation of two people who have made up their mind they are going separately only God can explain well I have some people say amen so let me also borrow that for you I said whatever crisis may be in your family will be over tonight he provides that's why the Bible says in Philippians 4 verse 19 Philippians 4 19 my God shall supply all your needs he protects that's the second P he protects in Isaiah 54 from verse 15 to 17 Isaiah 54 from verse 15 to 17 he made a promise to his partners he said don't worry there'll be those who will gang up against you he said but I will deal with them when they gather together against you he said nah, they will fall for your sake and he went on to say there's no weapon fashioned against you that will prosper A daughter of mine was giving a testimony of what happened when she was a, just a small girl. And uh, there was this river where they go to fetch water for the school where she was attending. And she did, students were there fetching water and there was this old woman who came and brushed them aside to fetch her own water first. And this little girl said, oh, no, you can't do that. We have been here. Not knowing the kind of woman. That old woman got home, got a calabash, put some water there and began to chant some incantation. And the calabash broke. The following day, she came to confess. This fellow cannot be touched. I pray for you. Anybody chanting any form of incantations against you, the calabash will break. <laughs> he protects. Psalm 20 from verse 7 to 8. Psalm 20, 7 to 8 says, Some people may trust in chariots, some may trust in horses, but we will put our trust in the Lord. When they fall, we will stand. Not only does he protect, he defends. My son had mentioned to you Second Kings chapter 1 from verse 9 to 12. Second Kings chapter 1 from verse 9 to 12. When some soldiers came to arrest Elijah, <laughs> and they said, Elijah, you are under arrest. He said, ah. <laughs> you don't know who I am. I am a partner of the consuming fire. And he gave them a taste of the fire. Anybody trying to arrest your progress, the fire of God will deal with him. And you know very well in 2 Kings chapter 6. Thank you, Lord. Well, let me finish this song because it's slightly different from the one you know. Because the family will be singing this song very soon. Oh, Sana in the highest. Let me finish now. Wait. <laughs> Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. My family is singing. Hosanna in the highest. If it's your family, sing it now. Hosanna in the highest. 
Hosanna in the highest. My family singing. Write it down. Within the next one month, your family will be singing that song. In Second King chapter six, from verse eight to seventeen, Second King six eight to seventeen, when a king sent a whole army to go and arrest Elisha. Elijah has got to open the eyes of the servant after he has told him, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. I want to assure you, you become his partner. Wherever you go, his bodyguard will go with you. And then number three, is it number three or four? Number four, he equips them. In Mark chapter 3, from verse 13 to 15, Mark chapter 3, from verse 13 to 15, when he had selected 12 people out of the crowd, he gave them power. And like my friend from Germany has said in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Acts chapter 1 verse 8, the Almighty God said, you will receive power. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you, he will keep you for your assignment. Everything you need to succeed in your assignment, he will make available. That's why Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, Philippians 4, 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Number five, the senior partner supports the junior partner. He supports he, he backs you up. He told Moses in Exodus chapter 3. Oh, amen. And he asked me to tell his children that the people concerned will understand. He said, where sorrow used to reign supreme, joy unspeakable will take the place. I rejoice with that family. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 11 to 12, Exodus 3, 11 to 12, he told Moses, don't worry, you won't go alone. I will be with you. They can't see me. That's why I'm sending you. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, from verse 34 to 37, 1 Samuel 17, 34 to 37, when David came face to face with Goliath, and King Saul said, no, you can't do this job. You can't defeat this fellow. Uh, he said, I've killed a lion before. I've killed a, a bear before. The God who was with me when I was dealing with the lion and the bear, he will be with me concerning this Goliath. And what was this King Saul said? He said, go, the Lord be with you. I decree in the name that's above every other name, you will never be alone again. In Matthew 28, from verse 18 to 20, Matthew 28, from verse 18 to 20, 
when he was sending out the disciples to go into the world and preach the gospel, he said, and lo, I am with you always. I will be the senior partner, you'll be my junior partner, I will support you. I will be with you always. In Acts of the Apostles, sorry, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, Hebrews 13, verse 5, he said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. If you are his partner, he will never forsake you. I told you that well, after I became born again, and the, one way or the other, I ended up becoming general overseer. And the church was very, very rich at that time. So rich that the total income of the church was less than my monthly salary at the university where I was coming from. And we had a staff of 40 people to pay. I will tell you how much each one will be getting. Almighty God, how am I going to survive? He made me a promise. He said, I have only one promise for you. Wherever you go, I will go with you. And I will be your source. I want to pass that blessing to my children tonight. From tonight onward, wherever you go, my God will go with you. And he will be your source. <laughs> it may be tough at the beginning, but I want to assure you, if you are his partner and you have that assurance, sooner or later, people will discover that there is no employer like God Almighty. He will spoil you. Yeah. Whether you believe it or not, doesn't matter. Become his partner and you will see him in action. Now, in Mark chapter 10, from verse 28 to 30, Mark 10, 28 to 30, Peter asked Jesus, we have left all and we are following you. Hey, <laughs> what's going to be our reward? And the Lord answered him. He said, I say unto you, anything you have left for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, in this world, I will give you <laughs> a hundredfold. You can't trade with God and lose. It's not possible. His company can't close down. The success of his company has nothing to do with the economy of a nation. His bank in heaven never closes. When he says, I will be with you, relax. Day and night, it will be there. And you know the beauty of it, like I told you, you don't even have to knock many doors before it will open. All you have to say is in Jesus' name and the doors will open. And in the name that's above every other name, beginning from tonight, multiple doors will open unto you. Number seven. He will honor his partners. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, thank you, Father. I want to say amen to this before I tell you. <laughs> you know, God was speaking in Numbers chapter 12. I think around verse 5 to 8, Numbers 12. 
<sighs> and he, he said if there be any prophets among the people, he will reveal himself to the prophet either by dream or vision. He said, but when he comes to Moses, he talks to him mouth to mouth. Almighty God asked me to tell someone that as Moses is unique among the prophets, so you will be among his ministers. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30, 1 Samuel 2, verse 30, God's promise, He said, I will honor those who honor me. One of the honors that those who are his partners will get is that he will personally introduce them to his father. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. Matthew 10, verse 32. He says, if you confess me before me, I will confess you before my father in heaven. And the way he honors them is by promoting them above all members of staff. In Exodus chapter 7, verse 1, Exodus 7, verse 1, maybe we'll come to that later on in the year. God said to Moses, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh. In other words, he was telling Moses, one day, Pharaoh will come and beg you for a blessing. The Almighty God took a boy called Elijah, the Tishbite, in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. Elijah, the Tishbite. Elijah was of such a low family background, they never mentioned his father's name. Whereas they mentioned the name of the father of Bartimaeus, the beggar. Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. Elijah has no son name. But when God picked him up, he became even a terror to a king. I don't know how highly God is going to take somebody here today, but somebody will become a partner of God and you'll be promoted beyond your widest expectations. So now, let's come to the role of the junior partner. My son who spoke before me he said that you must obey, you must agree with your senior partner. And he gave you the passage, Amos chapter 3, verse 3. Two can't work together except they be agreed. We can't we can be in the same business. Me being the senior partner, you being the junior partner, and then we argue every day. I will tell you, Oga, go and start your own company. You must agree. And agree now, we make it easy for you to obey him. Totally. In John chapter 15, from verse 14 to 15, John 15, from verse 14 to 15, Jesus Christ said, you are my friends if you obey if you do whatsoever i command you whatsoever i command you number three once you decide to become his partner there must be no looking back you can't decide that I will be his partner today and say you are no longer interested. In Luke chapter 9, verse 57 to 62, Luke 9, 57 to 62, 
he made it abundantly clear. Once you've laid your hands on the plow, there must be no looking back. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38, he said, If anybody turns back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. There must be no looking back. And then you must be 100% faithful to him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, the Bible tells us that it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. You must be trustworthy. Now, the reason why many of us might not be able to receive the kind of power God wants to release to us is that God is not sure you will use the power well. Because the more power you have, the more provocations you are likely to have from the devil. The devil will want you to use your power to satisfy yourself. If you be the Son of God, turn this stone to bread, etc., etc. But if you are faithful to Him, you will listen to Him and do only what He wants done. You know the story of Elijah that we mentioned earlier on in Second Kings chapter one. You can read it from verse nine downwards. First fifty soldiers came, and the captain he roasted them. Another fifty, and captain came, he roasted them. The third one came, and humbled himself. And God spoke to Elijah, "Don't roast this one. Go with him." I had one of my children talking not too long ago. I said. Uh, God, just give me power. Anybody messes around with me, I'm not going to be like a Daddy Gio. I finish them. He said, Daddy Gio is the one who say, hey, if you kill all your enemies, who is going to watch you while you are eating at the table God prepared before you? He said, I don't want them to see me. Let me just wipe them out. You would listen to God. Listen to your senior partner. Do only what he allows you to do. And you are supposed to be faithful till the end. Faithful to the end. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Revelation 2, verse 10. He said, you must be faithful to the end, and then you will get the crown of life. Oh, thank you, Father. Daddy asked me to stop for two minutes. He wants to do something very special. Thank you. A few special requests. Do you have something very special you want? A miracle that you need urgently? For two minutes, ask for it now. The wind of God is blowing. It's blowing now. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Oh, Lord, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father.
Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. 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 Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Well, the one who sent me asked me to tell you it is done. Oh, come on. Shout hallelujah. Shout another one. Shout another hallelujah. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Daddy says the testimonies that will come from tonight's service will be many. Shout another hallelujah. Amen. Okay. Now, so, uh, you must obey him. You must agree with him. You must obey him totally. You must be faithful and uh, faithful to the end. You must be willing to endure hardness. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. Hardness, not hardship. Hardness, you must be tough. Like soldiers of Christ, you must be tough. As his partner, there will be times when he will say, you can't sleep, you must pray throughout the night. Hardness. And soldiers, there will be time when they will say, you can't eat, you must fast. Hardness. Not hardship. Hardness. You must be tough. Well, that's one thing I thank God for, for the redeemed Christian Church of God. Little by little, he has been teaching us hardness. You won't believe it that I heard that one, one priest was complaining that I asked you to fast for 50 days. He said, what kind of God is that, that this man is serving? What kind of God we ask people to fast for 50 days before he will answer them? I said, why are you angry? I, I'm not talking to your congregation. I'm talking to my own children. My children have not complained to you. Let me ask you, are you tired of fasting? <laughs> I mean, I'm even already thinking, it's a long time ago that we fasted for 100 days. Maybe we should bring 100 days back. Hardness, tough. You must be willing to pay any price. 
Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 15. Second Corinthians 12, verse 15. Paul says, I'm willing to spend and be spent. Spend and be spent. Acts 21, from verse 10 to 14. Acts 21, from 10 to 14. Paul said, I'm not only ready to suffer, but if need be, I'm ready to die for the cause of Christ. You must be willing to pay the price. Now, partners are a select group of people. They are not just any Dick and Harry in the congregation. They are specially selected. In Mark chapter 3, from verse 13 to 15, Mark 3, 13 to 15, Thank you, my father. Lord asked me to tell another woman here tonight, he said, the doctors have just told you you can't have a child. He asked me to tell you, nine months from now, you will show them your baby. In Mark chapter 3, from verse 13 to 15, Mark 3, 13 to 15, Bible says there was a crowd around Jesus Christ, but he climbed to a mountain and began to select. Select. Special people. In John chapter 15, from in verse 16, John 15, verse 16, he said, You have not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you for a particular purpose that you go bring forth fruit and then make sure your fruit will abide select people it's not just everybody that can become his partner select people chosen one he said in Matthew 22, verse 14, Matthew 22, verse 14, he said, many are called, but few are chosen. So how can I have the honor of being chosen? After all, we know God is sovereign. He does as he pleases. But in Acts chapter 10, from verse 34 to 35, Acts 10, 34 to 35, the Bible tells us that, yes, he's sovereign, but he's no respecter of persons. And in every nation, every nation, he that fears God and works righteousness is accepted of him. Who shall I say? Who will go for me? I'm here, Lord. I fear you. I will obey you. I won't mess around. I'm here. Like he said in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30, 1 Samuel 2, verse 30, you must be willing to honor him. He that honors me, I will honor. Like I've told you when he's, when he's talking about first fruit. Number one is the senior partner. And the senior partner needs to, I mean, has the right to say, hey, 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 hey. anything that comes into this business, I have the first choice of it all. But God said it is honoring him when you do that. He doesn't need your money. The owner of the business, when at the end of the day they are talking about uh, uh, dividends, he owns the company. 
So when they say your dividend is so much, many a times he will just be laughing. He doesn't need it. He already has more than sufficient. And that's why he says, if you honor him with your first fruit, he said, he will also return the honor to you, that you too will have more than sufficient. That's his promise. And believe in God for you, that one day, somebody will come to you and say, I traveled, and I want to bring you something. But I don't know what to bring to somebody who already has everything. One day you will have more than sufficient. You want to be his partner? You must be willing to be a fool for his sake. First Corinthians chapter 1. From verse 26 to 29. First Corinthians chapter 1 from verse 26 to 29. The people he will choose are those who are ready to let go their position, their, their, their brilliance, etc. etc. Et and just say, hey. I'm ready to be a fool for God's sake. Like I told you last month, I am a fool. That's why he chose me. Let me tell you the truth. The worst person that God could say is choosing to be a pastor is a mathematician. Because mathematics and Christianity, they run in parallel lines. Mathematics will say, if you prove it, I will believe it. Christianity will say, if you believe it, I will prove it. Exact opposites. But then God can cross the line and grab a fool and turn him to a vessel unto honor. The reason why many of you are still just members of the congregation, you come in, sit down, hear the sermon, go as customers. It's because you don't want one little pastor to begin to control you and say you are a worker. That's why there are many people in the churches and there are very few workers. But I believe some people will hear the word of God tonight and decide to become fools for Christ. Let me round up. Because I want you to spend some time in praying tonight. Because your life is just about to change. I came as a customer. I end up a partner. That will be your testimony too. Like we have been told at the very beginning. Fire is involved in preparing whoever will be his partner. Before he began to talk to Moses, there was fire. Fire on the mountain. <laughs> and before people really know who Elijah was, on Mount Carmel, fire fell. In Isaiah chapter 6, from verse 1 to 8, Isaiah 6, from verse 1 to 8, before he could say, Who will I send? Who will go for me? He had 
needed to use fire to touch the mouth of Isaiah. If you look at the book of Isaiah, you'll find that Isaiah thought he was already a big prophet. He had been prophesying from uh, Isaiah chapter 1 to 5. Big prophecies. But after the fire touched his lips, then you see how many, how many more chapters that he wrote. He became such a powerful prophet that he could stand up and say, The Lord himself will give you a sign. A virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. Ah, if an ordinary prophet said that they would stone him to death, but after the fire touched his lips, <laughs> they knew that whatever he says will come to pass. I'm not claiming to be Isaiah. But in the name that's above every other name, in the name of the one who has touched my lips with fire, I decree that it will be well with you. And then you will notice the relationship between God and Peter. God had promised Peter, you will be fisher of men. For almost three and a half years, he didn't catch a single man. But when the fire fell on Mount Carmel, ah, things changed. Things are about to change for you. Yeah. If you like, say amen. If you like, don't. Yeah. No, do you see, the reason why I say you don't, need, don't really need to say amen is because I am not praying. I'm just telling you the truth. Because the fire is going to fall on you tonight. And once the fire falls, nobody will be able to stop you. But before the fire can fall on you, because the fire of God is a consuming fire, and what fire does, as I've told you before, when fire comes in contact with anything, it changes that thing to itself. Whatever refuses to be changed to fire becomes ashes. When the fire of God falls on you tonight, everything that is divine will begin to flow through you. But whatever is not of God is going to become ashes. That's why you cannot become a partner of God unless you are thoroughly born again. You know, the Bible says if a man be in Christ is a new creature, all things pass away. How many things become new? All oh, things. So if you are ready for a new life, not as a customer, not even as a staff, but an, as a partner of the consuming fire himself, 
Step number one is that you must be born again. Your salvation must be thorough. You must know that to know that to know that you are truly, truly born again. You must be born again in such a manner that you would not want to have anything to do with sin anymore. So I'm going to give a long rope because I know some of you are very far away tonight. I'm going to count from 1 to 20. If you want to make sure that you are 100% born again, before I say 20, make sure you are already standing before the altar. I'm counting now 1. Two, so if you are far away, you better begin to come quickly because I will soon reach 20. Three, four. Five, oh, six, seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. Eleven, twelve, thirteen, eighteen. Nineteen, Keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. I wait some seconds more. Now those of you already in front, begin to pray, begin to cry unto God. Ask him to have mercy on you. Ask him to save your soul. Those of you on the way, just hurry up. Make sure you get here before I finish praying. So just cry to God and say, Lord, have mercy on me. Save my soul. I will serve you. I don't want to have anything to do with sin anymore. And I don't even want to be just an ordinary customer. I want to become a partner with you. Go ahead and cry to the Almighty God. 
and the rest of us, let's stretch our hands towards these people and intercede for them. Pray that the Almighty God will save their souls, give them genuine salvation, just as he did for us. Pray for them, brethren. Those of you on the way, hurry up. Hurry up. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Savior, I want to thank you for your word. I want to give you all glory and honor for all the people who have surrendered their lives to you now. Please receive them in Jesus' name. Have mercy on them, Lord. Let your blood wash away their sins. Save their souls and write their names in the book of life. Let them become true children of God. And from now on, any time they cry unto you, please answer them by fire. Thank you, Almighty God. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, I rejoice with those of you who have come forward. I promise you from now, by God's grace, I'll be praying for you. The counselors will be around you in a moment, and they will collect the information I need from you, your names, your address, and your prayer requests. And then they'll pass it on to me, and I promise you I'll be praying for you. God bless you. Now, thank you, Lord. Amen. Now, while the counselors are attending to these people, maybe you want to write down your own prayer points so that you can pray about them tonight. Number one, of course, is you want to thank the Almighty God for keeping you alive to today. Because things are about to happen now in your life that had never happened before. Then number two, you're going to cry unto him and say, Father, let your fire fall on me. And break every yoke in my life. Let your fire fall on me and break every yoke in my life. Destroy every yoke in my life. Number three, we prayed a prayer last night for those of us who came for the Holy Communion. We pray that the fire of God will go into us and everything inside us that is not of God, the fire of God will consume it there. Make that your prayer point number three. Number four. Jesus Christ said, those who will drink, of the water I will give them. Out of their bellies will flow rivers of living waters. Yesterday, after we drank the wine, we cried to God. And from that moment onward, out of our belly will be flowing rivers of fire. Put that down as your number four. So that when you decree, it will be established. From my being, let rivers of fire begin to flow. Number five. I want to say, Father, from now, when I pray, immediately let fire fall. 
immediately. Let fire fall. Number six. So, Father, drench me so much in your fire that even my sweat will carry the fire of God. Even my sweat will carry the fire of God. So that anyone I touch we get a taste of the fire of God. Anyone I touch will get a taste of the fire of God. Number seven. Father, if you are looking for someone to send, I am available. I will love to be your partner. If you're looking for a partner, I'm available, Lord. I would love to be your partner. Number eight. Father, you promise that the testimonies from tonight's service will be many. Please let my own be among the biggest ones. Let my own be among the biggest ones. And then number nine. If you have any special request of your own, you add it. And the altar is open. You come. And tonight's prayer is not the kind of prayer you pray quietly. You are calling for fire. With the real sense of the word. Go ahead, cry unto God, let them move. Move that barrier. Move that barrier. Move the barrier, my friend. Remove the barrier. Open your mouth and cry to him. If the fire falls on you, you can't be quiet.
In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. The fire of God, the fire of the Holy Spirit, will fall on every one of us. That fire will enter into us. Every plant that God has not planted in us will be consumed by that fire. Out of our bellies will begin to flow rivers of fire. Even our sweat will be of fire. The moment we pray, fire will fall. Anyone we touch will have a taste of the fire. Every mountain before us, we met before the fire. From now on, whenever we decree, it shall be established. As many of us as are willing to be partners of God, the Almighty God will accept us. He will provide for us. He will protect us. He will defend us. He will keep us. He will honor us. He will promote us. He will draw us close to himself. He will purify us. As many as the testimonies of tonight may be, we will get the best. From now on, Anyone we witness to, we surrender to Jesus. So shall it be. In Jesus' mighty name we are prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. You may return to your seats.